so much. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time uh, to joining us in this uh, in tonight's webinar. I'm Valentinus Perley uh, from SPE Java Indonesia section. I'm accompanied by uh, several other SPE Java Indonesia uh, committee. Uh, we have Mbak Dian in here, Dian Permanasari, and also Mas Handika Lazuardi uh, from T uh, TDGDL uh, division. And we also have Pak Tommy from SPE membership. Uh, so before we start, I would like to share with you the schedule for today. Uh, so this is roughly the plan for, for tonight. Uh, shortly, we're going to open this uh, event. And then uh, we're going to have a moderator and speaker introduction. Uh, but before that, uh, we're going to have a short presentation from SPE membership. Uh, and after the intro of moderator and speaker, we're going to have uh, the main presentation uh, of the, tonight's event. Uh, and we're going to end that presentation with a photo session uh, before we do a Q&A. And hopefully, we're going to end this event uh, at 9 p.m. sharp. Okay. Uh, so uh, tonight, we're going to have Pat Doc Peacock from Gaffney Klein. Uh, he will present the topic, uh, the SPE CO2 Storage Resources Management System, or SRMS in short. Uh, and as a moderator, I am delighted to welcome Mbak Diovani Swandrina Putri uh, from Pertamila Hulu Energy, or PHP. Okay, so uh, before we go to the uh, event, I will hand it over the floor to Pa uh, Tommy uh, for a short presentation on SPE membership. Pa Tommy, over to you. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. All right, thanks very much. Uh, good evening to everyone, or, or morning or afternoon, if you're joining us from outside of Indonesia. Give me one moment and I will uh, share my screen. Perfect. Does everybody have visibility of my screen? Yes, yes Tommy. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thanks very much for the introduction. And I would like to uh, take about five minutes of everybody's time to give you a little bit of an introduction to SPE and, and why the membership is so important. And obviously, it's why it's brought us here uh, today and so on. Um, we are definitely looking into, you know, to remind everyone for the current members to renew their membership, um, but also encouraging um, others that are not members to become members. So with that being uh, said, I just give you a real brief understanding of who we are. Um, SPE, Society of Petroleum Engineers, is the largest individual member organization serving engineers, scientists, managers, and other professionals worldwide in the oil and gas industry and actually going beyond the oil and gas industry as we get into clean energy now. So uh, it's not only limited just to uh, engineers itself, but even to service companies, uh, business development, individual professionals, and so on. Currently, we do have 124,000 plus members around the world. Well, that's 15 regions and 134 countries. Um, there's over 100 plus events for uh, Java section alone. You know, we definitely have events every month, uh, could be more than once a month uh, and so on. But SB, SB itself does provide an unparalleled insight and share of expertise and lifelong learning uh, community to strengthen and fuel the success of our members. And we'll get into more details about that in the next few slides. Um, about our mission, uh, that is to collect, disseminate, and exchange technical knowledge, uh, provide opportunities for professionals to enhance their technical and professional competencies. And our vision is to enable the global oil and gas ENP industry to share the technical knowledge and required to meet the world's energy needs in a safe um, and environmental responsible manner. What makes us unique? Um, we are not for-profit organization. 
Um, we exist for the benefit of our members. Um, our technical content for programs is developed mainly by the members itself. And then of course the main beneficiaries, uh, workers and customers are all the same people, which are the SPE members themselves, excuse me, themselves. A little bit about SPE in Asia Pacific. Um, so our presence here at, in APAC in Asia Pacific, um, every event for every geographical and discipline, so eight events in five locations each year. Uh, there's over 10,000 members within Asia Pacific region alone. Conferences, symposia, um, workshops, forums are all catered to every discipline that you can imagine um, for regional Director of SPE uh, is Mr. Uh, Henricus uh, Herwin, and then uh, Mr. Neil Kovana, who is our chief, uh, the chief scientist of Woodside Energy, who is our regional directors. As far as upcoming SPE events, um, some of these actually are already passed, but we do have some upcoming uh, and, uh, as soon as March of next year. Um, so we definitely want to encourage you to look uh, at participating in the, uh, the IPTC, which will be held in Bangkok, Thailand, and hopefully we'll have an updated uh, um, schedule for events in 2023 past March that'll come soon. Going over the benefits uh, as membership uh, goes in that, but again, you know, as we talked, you know, being the world's leading technical knowledge of resources and having access, not only to papers and so on, but also to individuals and members alone, um, meeting and sharing with peers and, and volunteering. So it gives you an opportunity for uh, you know, networking and, and, and so on and looking for other opportunities, um, access to training certification and your professional development. And then of course, recognizing the best in the industry, we do have annual uh, award and recognition events. So. Um, as far as additional benefits for our membership, only for the Java section, that is becoming a member, you would get free registration for the SP Java events, which you have, we're here all today, uh, right now. Um, you also have the opportunity of volunteering for uh, the various uh, um, events that we have here in, in the Java section. Um, you could either be a committee, an event committee, speaker, a moderator, or uh, as a professional member. And then of course, becoming a mentor for our young uh, um, um, professionals um, who are just now just graduating and that are getting into the industry. So, Other benefits that we offer is access to technical resources. I won't go over one by one, but a couple of my favorites alone are the One Petro, um, where you will have access to various papers um, you do get a bonus when joining, and we'll go over that in a little bit. There is the SPE Connect uh, and so on. And then the JPT, which has actually gone digital uh, and the, has gone away from the hard copy. So there's various uh, resources that you can sign up, uh, receive in your email, or become part of. We talked about networking opportunities and that, of course, with the events. You know, they are in a global, regional, and local. So as we mentioned earlier, uh, in Thailand coming up in March, and of course here locally. And fortunately, with, uh, now that we are exiting the pandemic, we will hope to have some in-person events here in Indonesia. Um, conferences, workshops, we also participate in uh, 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 conferences such as the IPA and so on. Um, then you have the SBE Connect, and that's where we bring all the members um, together, uh, similar discipline and workshops and, and discussions that are a little bit more granular. For professional development, again, there's online and in-person training that uh, courses that are available, competency management tools, and then, of course, the petroleum engineering certification. And awards and recognition, as we mentioned earlier, those are typically there for, for major technical awards that we recognize, distinguished services, and then membership awards for Java Indonesia section itself, which we will also be having uh, in uh, February of next year. A little bit about the young professionals, um, benefits of our young professionals, obviously the AIM mentoring, webinars, um, providing career pathways, ambassador lectures, Emerging Leader Alliances is a three-day intensive leadership course. 
um, career pathway fairs where young professionals speak with senior engineers one-to-one -to, -one to get a better understanding of what it's like. Um, and then articles on interesting voluntary and technical achievements of young professionals. And then the young professionals workshop and events, whether you will look to, you know, to look at uh, and, and enhance your communication skills, you might need work on your CV, um, inter interview skill training, and so on. That's also available. So I think we'll wrap it up. We got two more slides here, but we, we definitely want to ask you, you know, if you're not a member, please do join. Uh, we encourage you to, to join. And if you are a member and your membership is going to be coming up for a renewal, do renew that. Um, back in 2022, there were some things that had changed. Um, there was installment payment options that were out. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the JPT went digital and six free technical papers with the one Petro that I mentioned also. Um, so would definitely, you can reach out if you'd like to do a group uh, membership uh, registration or renewals, we'd be happy to help you with that. Um, membership fees, you, you can see right here on the left, um, students for students and Southern University students is free and is sponsored. Um, and you also get one free year after your graduation. So keep that in mind. Um, payment options, this is something that we've actually have been able to overcome in 2022. And so, you know, you can also pay online by your credit card in United States dollars. SPE accepts that Visa, MasterCard and other credit cards, check or money order, um, PayPal. And again, if you are having some difficulties, please reach out to myself or my, uh, my colleague, uh, Orianda, who can help you. Um, We'll, we'll, we'll guide you to get that payment done here. And then of course, for lifetime memberships, if those of you, you know, there is the, the cost of a lifetime membership, which is 20 times the highest currently applicable dues and rates. So that's not necessarily the rate currently applicable. If you're looking to pay for a lifetime membership, we'd also be able to help you with that also. Um, and one more thing, the company bulk payment is something that we, uh, we've been helping a, a lot of companies here in Indonesia to do so. Uh, payment options, dues and waivers, permanent disability, unemployment or furloughed or active military duty and so on. Again, submit a written request. You can send that directly to SPE themselves. We'll be happy to help you with that also um, and so on. But again, beginning December 1st, um, you should submit that request. Uh, we do not accept requests prior to December, which so we're already past that, so that's fine. And I think this is the last slide, but a payment option and reinstatement. So let's say, for example, if your membership has been expired for the last two years or plus, you do have the option to reinstate your membership and gain uh, the last few years uh, back again. So that option one, number one, they retain your original date, join date. Um, it allows you to pay outstanding back dues, so you would have to pay back the, the years that have expired or you have been inactive. Um, and then option two, again, receive a new join date, and that will allow you to be responsible for paying the current year's dues and date to reinstate your membership. And again, if you have any questions of that, you're more than happy to reach out to us directly. So um, that wraps it up for the uh, membership uh, part here. And I uh, really appreciate the time, but definitely uh, if you're not a member, please do register and become a member. And if your membership is going to expire, um, do renew your membership. It's, um, it's the members that keep the SBE alive and allows us to have events that we're, uh, we're participating in this evening, as you see. So that, uh, that concludes my portion of the membership uh, section and I appreciate everybody's time. Thank you. Thank you, Patomi. Okay. Uh, thank you, Patomi, for, for the presentation. Uh, a brief but thorough uh, presentation about SPE activity and also SPE membership. Uh, so we are now back to the main event. Uh, I will hand it over the floor to our moderator. Mbak Giovanni, Mbak Giovanni will moderate the event uh, for now. Uh, she will introduce uh, herself and then she will also introduce our uh, esteemed speaker for today.
Okay, uh, thank you, Ms. Valen, for this opportunity and good evening, everyone. And welcome to the SP Java section technical discussion group webinar series, the sixth on the CCS topic. And really do appreciate for your time taking here and joining us in this beautiful evening. So let me introduce myself. I'm Diofani Sondrina Putri, and I'm currently working as the Analyst Business Ventures at PT Pertamina Hulu Energy. And I'm joined by the evening speaker, Pak Doug Peacock. And um, today we will be discussing the SPE CO2 Storage Resource Management System, or shortly called as SRMS. And in the following subsequent session, Pak Doug will be discussing this topic in further more detail. And now please allow me to read a brief biography of Pak Doug before he begins his presentations. So on the next slide, we can see that Pak Doug is a technical director in the Gafnik line based in Singapore. He got his bachelor degrees in geological science from Leeds University UK, and he got his master degree in petroleum geology from Imperial College London. He has um, 40 years experience in the oil industry and a variety of geoscience positions, including this extensive 19 years with the Gafnik line. He was also the SPS Distinguished Lecturer from uh, 2010 until 27, uh, 2011, and a recent member of the SPO and Gas Research Committee, or OGRC. He also teaches several training courses on reserve, um, PRMS, probably we all familiar with, and also the Carbon Storage, or SRMS. And he also has been involved in several Carbon Capture and Storage, or CCS, projects in Southeast Asia region. So by this short brief summary of his biography, we all know that uh, Pak Doug is a very distinguished uh, speaker to discuss with the CCS topic. And on the next slide, let me um, give you a brief summary of what we'll be discussing this evening. So as we know that probably, um, according to the Global CSE CCS Institute, that without CCS, then zero is practically impossible. So the CCS will be required under all of the scenarios if global climate goals are meant to be met by 2050 in a cost-effective manner. So the CO2 SRMS is a classification system designed to provide a consistent approach to estimate stable CO2 quantities, evaluate projects, and also to present results within a comprehensive framework. And this system was actually released by the SPE back then in 2017. And on this um, evening, we also will be discussing the main features of the SRMS comparing with the PRMS itself. And we'll be also discussing the example of SRMS usage uh, on this evening. So on the next slide, I will be explaining a few house rules. First thing first, Please kindly mute your microphone during the presentation. So if you do have any questions, please do put it in on the chat box. And you can raise your hand and ask directly during the Q&A session after the presentation is finished. So, um, and also be prepared uh, to turn on your camera for the documentation as well. So without further any ado, uh, we will come Pak Doug as the speaker. So uh, I will hand it over to you, Pak Doug. The time and screen is yours. Uh, thank you very much, dear Fanny and uh, Pak Tommy and, uh, and Pak Valen. Um, let me share my slides. Just hang on a second. So you should now be, can I just confirm that you can see my title slide? Yes, but yes, okay, okay. Um, uh, welcome everybody. Thank you very much for, um, uh, uh, for for inviting me here. It's a great it's a great pleasure um, to be talking uh, to the uh, the SPE Java section. Uh, I hope you find it useful um, to talk about the SRMS, the SPE. CO2 storage resources management system. Um, uh, just a uh, standard disclaimer that the 
the views that I will be expressing today are, are my personal views of the author. Um, they're not necessarily the views of the SPE um, or any, any other organization. Um, uh, Diofani just, just, just um, presented my, um, my bio just now, but I, I just wanted to, to, to give you a little, a little bit more background, um, and in particular my background in, in reserves and the PRMS, because uh, as we'll see later, the SRMS is very much based on the PRMS. Um, so it's a, it's a very natural progression um, to go from one to the other. I'm going to sound like a walking advertisement for what Pat Tommy was just saying about, about how wonderful the SPE is, because um, most of the things that I've done in my career professionally in terms of um, involvement with societies have been through the SPE. And as you can see here, I was, I've been a, uh, an SPE Distinguished Lecturer. I was on the uh, Oil and Gas Reserves Committee. That's the committee that writes the PRMS. Um, I, I've done a lot of SPE conferences, workshops, um, webinars, and I, just from my own personal experience, I've found the SPE extremely rewarding um, professionally, and I would I would urge all of you to to to, to get involved. Um, I, I for one has have, have found it very much. It's a it's a give and take thing. The more you put in, um, the, the the more you get back. Um, so uh, moving on with the presentation, um, so what I'm going to be talking about today is I've got a little bit of an introduction about uh, carbon capture and storage uh, first to kind of kind of set the scene because that's where um, the SRMS fits. And then we'll talk about the SRMS um, itself in a little bit more, uh, a little bit more detail. So um, the first thing I'd like to do now, I, I know we don't have poll questions, um, but I, I'd just like to get an idea. Maybe you could just, can you type in the chat box? Um, I'd just be interested in what your sort of primary discipline is. Are you, are you all reservoir engineers or are you geologists like me or, or are you something else? Can you, can, can, can you just maybe um, sort of type in the chat box and, and uh, see? what we all are. Let me see if I can open up the chat. Okay, I'm seeing a lot of reservoir engineer. Almost everyone's reservoir engineer. Okay, all right. Okay, got one drilling, one economist. But my, okay, we're my, mostly reservoir engineers. Okay, that's fine. Um, just just, just uh, uh, it, it interesting for my, um, uh, for, for, for my knowledge. Okay, so, um, I think most of us probably know what um, carbon capture and storage, CCS, um, is. Um, this is a, there are many definitions, but this is a particularly simple one that I, I, I quite like because it's simple. It's from the London School of Economics. And it very simply is, CCS is the process of capturing and storing CO2 before it is released to the atmosphere. The, so the idea is to separate the CO2 from the atmosphere and to store it in the subsurface, ideally permanently, so that it it, uh, it never ever gets back to the um, uh, into the atmosphere again. Um, we heard some quotes um, in the in the introduction. Um, according to the uh, OGCI, the Oil and Gas Climate Initiative. CCS will be required under all scenarios if global climate goal targets are to be met by 2050 and beyond in a cost-effective manner. Almost all IPCC scenarios involve CCUS. And there's also a lot of talk about hydrogen uh, these days as, as part of the energy transition. It also says that a greater focus on low carbon hydrogen will also require CCS. So that will be what they call um, blue hydrogen, isn't it? Blue hydrogen is where it's um, uh, the hydrogen is created and the CO2 is then sequestered um, in the subsurface. So let's just have a look at 
one scenario. We've talked, we, we hear talk about all scenarios, and there are there are many. This is the this is the IEA's what they call comparison of the stated policies um, scenario, which is the yellow line at the top. Yeah, that's basically business as usual. Um, and then at the bottom in, in blue, you've got what they call the sustainable development scenario. And as you can see, there's a number of different components to reaching that sustainable development scenario. Um, greater efficiency, use of renewables, fuel switching, nuclear, and you see CCS here. Now, in this particular scenario, uh, CCS represents 9% of the, of the difference. There are, there are other scenarios that show CCS, CCUS being up to 30, or even I think the highest one I've seen is 33%. So one third potentially of carbon emissions reductions um, potentially coming from, 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 from CCS. So just to just sort of highlight a few a few key points here on the right, um, I think there's broad acceptance as we've seen from some of the the previous quotes um, that CCS is a key part of reducing carbon emissions. I think there's also a, a an acknowledgement that we need all of these solutions that are shown here. It's not either or. It's not like we need either renewables or CCS, we need all of the things listed here. Um, CCS is particularly relevant for industries that are hard to, what they call hard to abate industries. Some industries like um, electricity generation, for example, um, you can switch oil and gas to renewables, but there are some things that you, you can't switch iron and steel and cement production because you need particular, you need high temperatures and particular um, manufacturing methods that really need um, hydrocarbons. And then you need to burn the hydrocarbons and you need to do something about CCS. So CCS is really the only solution um, for, for some of these industries. And the other thing about these scenarios is not only is CCUS part of the solution, but it is a growing part of the solution. If you look at these different scenarios, just look at this one, you see the role of CCS increases with time. And I think pretty much all the scenarios that I've seen all involve CCUS becoming more important um, over the decades to come. So it's not a temporary solution, it's a scenario, it's a solution that's going to grow over the decades. And I think this next slide, I think we, we heard this quote before, um, without CCS, net zero is practically impossible. So what are we doing? What is the world uh, doing about CCS? Um, so this map that I'm showing here, I've taken this map, this particular map is from um, an organization called the Scottish carbon capture and storage website, although there are many other organizations that produce similar, uh, similar types of maps. And I, I quite like this one because it's a nice, uh, I think it's displayed in a, nice, in a nice way. So this particular map is um, color coded in terms of the, uh, the status, the maturity status of the project. You can see the color coding. Um, over here on the right, green operational blue pilot and so forth. Um, just a, a, a few things to note. Um, first of all, no, note where all the, uh, where the projects are concentrated. There's a lot in North America, there's a lot in Europe, and there's a lot in North Asia. There are some in, uh, in, in Southeast Asia, some in Australia. Um, I will just maybe just make a few other observations. Um, many of these projects in the US and Canada are um, 
CC, CC US projects for enhanced oil recovery. Most of the projects in Europe are pure CCS, CCS storage um, projects. So the, 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 there are some differences and I'll, I'll talk about those um, a little bit more in a moment. Um, in Indonesia, um, the only project that was actually on, the, on this original map was the Rindi project. Um, there are others um, that, that are being discussed, um, Arun and also Tango. I'll talk about Tango in a little bit more. Uh, I'm not going to talk about it in detail, but I will talk about it uh, um, a little bit more. And I know that, that there are others. Um, this, the, the trouble with these maps is that they change on an almost daily basis. You, every, every, every day you, you, you read the news, there seems to be a new, a new CCS project um, being announced. Uh, but it does give you an idea of um, where the projects are and, and what projects are, are, are being planned. Now, that map may have seemed like um, there were lots of projects, uh, and, and there were a lot. Um, this figure that I'm showing you here, this is from a study that was done in 2021 um, by a consultancy called the Kearney um, Institute. It's a very nice study, which I would, I would strongly recommend to you. Um, let me just explain what it is first. So first of all, here in gray, we're looking at uh, historical uh, CCUS. Now, most of this gray is those um, CO2 EOR, enhanced oil recovery projects in, in North America. Almost all of the CO2 that's been put in the ground to date has been put in, ground, in the ground for, for EOR projects in the US over the last um, actually several decades, this doesn't go back all the way, but um, CO2 has been used for enhanced oil recovery for since the 1970s, I think. Um, moving forward in the future, so what, what these guys did was they looked at the projects that are currently um, in planning and they, and they put an estimate of what projects and how much uh, CO2 they would be storing. And they did that up to 2030. But in order to meet that sustainable development scenario that I showed you a few slides ago, the, the SDS, um, we need to be here. So there is a huge gap between not only what we're doing and what we're planning, but what we need to do as a, as a planet um, and as, as an industry on a global basis. Um, so we need a big, a big scale up of um, carbon capture and storage on a global scale in order to meet these um, to meet these goals. Now, another little thing I want to to highlight: I've been using the terms CCS and CCUS um, interchangeably um, so far, but I would like to draw a distinction um, between them now because it's it's uh, it, it, it's important. Um, so if we start with some CO2 that's either uh, potentially going to go into the atmosphere and we capture it in some way, there's basically two pathways it can take. We can sequester it, store it in the subsurface, CCS, carbon capture and storage, which is what the SRMS is about, that we'll talk about um, in, in a moment, or we can utilize it, we can use it in some way. Now at the moment, by far the most common usage of uh, CO2 is that enhanced oil recovery that I was just talking about, mainly in, uh, in, the, in the US and North America. There are other uses, um, probably familiar with you know, fizzy drinks and um, you know, various other um, industrial uses of CO2, but I don't know the percentage, but it is a large percentage. It's of the order of 90% of um, CO2 is, is EOR. But what I'm going to be talking about from now on, almost exclusively, is the this pathway, yeah, where we're taking the CO2 and we're sequestering it in the subsurface, primarily for the purpose of storing it. 
yeah, not for the purpose of producing more um, oil or gas, but for the purpose of storing it. And this is where the SRMS comes in. Um, now, when we think about a, a carbon capture and storage uh, project, there is an entire value chain that goes with that. Um, so if we start on the, uh, on the left-hand side, we have a, 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 an emission source. What's the original source of the emissions? Is it from burning biomass? Is it from natural gas, from coal, from oil, um, or from other, other sources? And then how is that, um, what, how is that original source? How is it used? Is it used in a, for example, you know, the most the biggest um, volumetric component here is in is in power plants. There aren't there are many other uses. Then the CO2 has to be captured and either compressed or liquefied in some way, needs to be transported. And only here, this is the, the storage part that we're going to be talking about in more detail from now on. Um, so we talked earlier about EOR. Um, we can store in saline aquifers and we can store in depleted oil and gas fields, or we can utilize in some way as, I, as we looked at on the, on the, on the, previous, um, the previous slide. So where the SRMS comes in is here, storage in saline aquifers and uh, depleted oil and gas fields. Now, this is a kind of, um, sort of generic um, diagram. But what you can do from a diagram like this is any specific project will, will plot a path through this value chain. So if I just look at an example and just plot this one through. This is the Northern Lights project in Europe, a very high profile, large scale, um, CCS project uh, in Europe. So what they're doing there is they're capturing uh, CO2 from one of those hard to abate indus industries that I talked about, but from a cement plant, um, which is using coal. They're capturing it, they're separating it, it's being liquefied, and it's then being transported by ship and it's being stored in a saline aquifer. So this is the pathway that this project takes. If you think of another project, and I'm going to use the Tengu uh, as my example here. Um, so Tengu is coming from uh, natural gas, and it's actually capturing the CO2 from the gas processing, from the, from the gas plant. It's then going to be uh, separated. It's going to be compressed. It's going to be put in a pipeline, and then it's going to be used not for EOR, they call it EGR, Enhanced Gas Recovery at, uh, at, at, uh, at Tangu. So I, I, I have another presentation where I plot hundreds of these, but you get the idea. Any, any project will plot its um, uh, plot a different path through here. The other thing just want to highlight while we're here is it may or may not be the same company that is doing all of these parts. One of the things that we're seeing in the CCS industry is, a, is very much a separation between um, emitters at this end and transport and storage providers at this end. So there may be situation, I mean, Tengu, I think, is a situation where it's going to be it's the same company all the way through. Um, but here, for example, Northern Lights, this is a cement company yeah, that's doing this end. And then this uh, shipping and sequestration is being done by a, a consortium, primarily of oil and gas companies, um, energy companies, as they call themselves now. Um, so it may be one company, it may be two or, or, or more companies um, involved in the, in the entire value chain. So if we focus a little bit more now on the storage end of things. 
So reservoir engineers, this will be familiar territory for you, I expect. Um, so let's talk about, first of all, um, this uh, phase diagram. This is a CO2 phase diagram that we're looking at on the, uh, the right-hand side. So this illustrates why um, subsurface geological formations are so suitable um, for storing uh, CO2 in the subsurface. And in particular, I want to highlight this point here. This is the, the critical point for CO2 displayed in terms of temperature and pressure on this plot. So to the right and above this point, in this area here, CO2 exists as a supercritical fluid. So what that means is that above those conditions, it's in a supercritical state. So it's it's liquid-like in terms of its density. So it has a density of about 0.7, which is lighter than water. So in the subsurface, it will tend to rise under gravity. Um, but it has a viscosity that is close to gas. So it's easy to inject. So that makes it ideal. So when we're injecting CO2 into the subsurface, what we're aiming for is to have the gas in this uh, supercritical phase. So on the left-hand side now, we're looking at a, a kind of cartoon of how um, uh, a CO2 density versus depth diagram. So you can see that very quickly, um, CO2 um, density increases. Um, and also plotted on here, this, this critical depth is equivalent to the critical point on the phase diagram. So this is usually at about 800 meters. It may vary because there's, there's, um, there's obviously a temperature um, effect here. So you need to think about geothermal gradients, but it's typically at, at around 800 meters, maybe um, 1,000 uh, meters, about, about a kilometer um, in depth. So we want to be injecting and storing our CO2 at depths greater than that. So the CO2 remains in that uh, supercritical state. So this is an important um, plot, uh, an important, it's a schematic um, plot. It, it, it's quite old. It was first uh, used in a, in a famous um, IPCC, International, sorry, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change um, report from 2005. Um, and I've seen this plot reproduced many, many times. Um, it's in wide usage. But I do need to emphasize one thing about it. It is a schematic plot. A lot of people kind of look at this and, and to treat it literally. Because um, you see there's some, there's some literal, there's some scales on here. There are years since end of injection on the x-axis and trapping contribution on the y-axis. It's just a schematic. It's not meant to be taken literally. Um, but what it does show is um, a number of things. So it's showing the different ways in which uh, CO2 is trapped in subsurface. So if we start in the top left hand corner, um, this is the mobile phase. This is when we've injected CO2 into the subsurface and it's moving. So it's those buoyancy effects that I was just talking about. It's, it's buoyant in the subsurface. Then the first way that CO2 can be trapped is here what's called physical or static trapping, what's called here geological trapping. This is conventional trapping. This is the way, the same way that oil and gas is trapped in a, in a conventional trap. Yeah, it's in, a, in an anticline, in a, in a trap, um, and the CO2 is, is held in place by a, a cap rock um, that won't allow it to, um, to rise up um, any further. 
The second uh, trapping mechanism, we, as we move to the, um, the bottom right here, is residual trapping. So this is where CO2 has migrated over a distance. It's displaced the, the brine in the subsurface. And then the, the brine has then imbibed back such that the CO2 is then held um, in, a, in a residual state um, and is, is held there normally by, but, but by capillary, capillary forces. Um, this has relatively low risk once it's trapped in this form. It's very uh, secure. The moving further down towards the, um, the bottom right, the next is solubility trapping. This is where the CO2 actually dissolves in the water. Um, this typically only this happens at the, at the interface between the CO2 and the brine. Um, CO2, when it dissolves in water, makes the water denser. And it will tend to sink to the bottom. I've got some, some graphics and some cartoons. In fact, I've got a video as well to show you later. And then uh, the fourth component is uh, mineral trapping. This is where the CO2 um, actually uh, reacts chemically with the, uh, with the rock, particularly carbonates, um, and precipitates new, uh, new minerals. Typically a slow process but very secure. So coming back to this chart, um, you often see this sort of, as you're at the, the top left, you're risk prone, as in the CO2 can escape. There's potential for the CO2 to escape. And as you move to the bottom right, the CO2 becomes secured in a more and more secure state and is less and less likely um, to escape. And, and typically the, the, the boundary is, is here in this kind of between physical trapping and residual trapping. We often see um, this referred to as being risk prone up here and risk free or certainly lower risk uh, towards the bottom line. So that was a kind of schematic. So what does that look like in the, in the subsurface? So if you can imagine um, this cartoon, so we're injecting CO2 uh, here, uh, down dip. The CO2 is then migrating up dip because of the buoyancy that we just, we just talked about. So it can then be trapped in a number of different ways. So it can be trapped in that structural trapping that, that I just mentioned here, uh, in, in a conventional trap, an anticline, um, for example. It can be trapped residually. This is, oh, sorry. Residually, this is the slightly lighter color. So this is where it's, it, it's trapped um, by uh, uh, capillary forces, residual trapping. Then the third one, the again, slightly lighter color again, is this, uh, this color here where the, the CO2 is dissolved in the brine and, and starts to sink because it's, it's denser. And then not shown on this uh, figure is the mineral trapping where the CO2 is actually um, uh, chemically reacting with the, uh, with the rock itself. So in terms of a CCS project, and when we, when we come to the, the talk about the SRMS in a moment, the SRMS is concerned with these three key issues, injectivity, can you inject the CO2 in the first place? Uh, the storage capacity, how much room is there? How much space is there to, uh, to store the CO2? And thirdly, um, containment. Can you keep it um, in the subsurface or will it, will it leak out? We'll talk about that in a bit more detail. So some of the key things um, that we're interested in in a, in a subsurface assessment is what pathways does the CO2 take when you inject it? Yeah, it's, it's just it's not going to rise uniformly. It's going to depend on the, uh, uh, the geological architecture, 
the, uh, the permeability, the way the, re the reservoir architecture, the same way that uh, oil and gas um, uh, production um, does. It's going to depend on uh, things like the, uh, the clapping system. Yeah. What does our seal look like? How effective is our seal? If we have faults, do those faults seal or do they leak? Um, if we inject too much, are we going to breach the, uh, the trap? Um, the dissolution processes, how is the, uh, how is the CO2 going to uh, uh, dissolve and uh, potentially sink? So I promised you a video. Um, let me just introduce it um, first. So this is, the video I'm going to show you is, um, it's, it's obviously it's a simulation as you can see, but it's meant to represent a gently dipping aquifer. So if I just, just start in the top left here, this is uh, an example that's taken from the, uh, this is the Decatur project in the, uh, in the US. And what they're doing there is they're injecting uh, CO2, there's a row of injectors, they're at a depth of greater than two kilometers, so they're in that dense uh, phase. Um, mobile CO2 is migrating up dip, so you see there's a, there's a shallow dip on this, uh, on this aquifer. There's no trap, but there is a shallow dip, so what's happening is the CO2 is migrating up here, it's being trapped by capillary forces. Some of it is um, dissolving in the uh, in the uh, in the brine and sinking. And this is quite a nice analogy from a. Uh, I really like this guy Philip Ringrose. I don't know if you've heard of him. He's a very well known uh, CCS CCS author. Very often, when you think of CO two. Um, in the subsurface, you kind of think of like fizzy bubbles, you think of like Coca-Cola or champagne or something like that. But his analogy was olive oil in water, because that's the kind of density contrast that we're, that we're talking about. So this kind of, you know, sort of gloopy kind of um, behavior is more representative of um, the way that CO2 and water behave together. Okay, I promised you a video, let's see if this works. So let me just, let me just explain what's happening in this video first. So we're injecting CO2 here. So the red is going to be the CO2 we're injecting here. And we're injecting into a saline aquifer that has a very uh, shallow dip to it, perhaps just one or two degrees. And you're gonna see what's going to happen. This is when I first started. Um, oh. So I really like uh, this visualization that was put together. With... Sorry, I'm gonna turn. Turn, turn off the, so what you can see, let me just pause it for a second and explain what's going on. So the injection has now finished, but you see the CO2 plume is migrating up dip. And you see what's happening here? This is this dissolved CO2 um, starting to sink. The main plume you're going to see is going to mi migrate up dip, and then it's gonna stop because it's trapped by those capillary forces it doesn't keep on going forever. So let, let, let me just um, run the video for you. So you'll see it's still migrating, it's still migrating. Any minute now, it's gonna stop. It's not gonna get much further than here. There's some, some dissolving taking place, but it stops, so it, it's not getting up here. So now, us. It, it stopped, so our CO2 is now, it's now trapped. So it's a very nice, uh, I think, very nice example of um, what's happening in the subsurface. And this is the kind of thing that you do with your, with your, your reservoir simulation uh, studies when you're assessing a, uh, a, uh, a, 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 a CO2 um, project. Um, okay, let's move on. I just want to have a little thing I wanted to highlight is I, I, I mentioned gently dipping. <laughs> if this dips too much, the CO2 really can run away. The, the buoyancy effect is, is too strong. 
So gently dipping aquifer is okay. You don't want that dip to be too high because then the CO2 will just, just keep on uh, keep on running away. Um, okay, let's move on. Uh, a few other things that I just want to highlight some of this background before I talk about the uh, the SRMS because these things all all play into the, the PRMS. Um, I talked about leakage um, a little bit just now. Um, containment is one of the key things that we're concerned with um, in the SRMS and when you're doing a, a CCS project. You do not want the CO2 to leak out. Um, so understanding our cap rock, understanding potential leakage pathways, which could be um, through old well balls, could be through old well balls, they could be through the cap rock, they could be through faults, um, are all important uh, considerations. So obviously we try to avoid, we try to avoid leakage. We don't, we don't want um, it to leak. Um, what are some of the causes? Well, old wells, abandoned wells, um, behind casing, poor cement jobs, are at least in, in the US. Now, the US is a place that has a very long history of, um, uh, of drilling and oil production. Um, Indonesia is another country that has a long history. It probably has an awful lot of old wells. So if you're injecting, if you're in Indonesia and you're injecting CO2 into um, a depleted um, hydrocarbon reservoir, um, you really want to look at your at your old wells. They're probably your biggest leaking, leakage risk. Um, what's the cement like? Um, you might want to go back and, um, and have a look at those. Um, other ways in which um, CO2 can leak is um, overpressurization, over um, cracking of the cap rock. So you need to be very careful about um, what pressures uh, you, you inject at and what pressures are going to be reached. So you may need to um, uh, geomechanical studies are often a very um, big part of any CCS um, assessment. Uh, forks and fractures, obviously, are potential um, leakage pathways. Fault reactivation is a big concern um, for CCS projects. Um, plume migration direction is also important. Um, I showed that kind of uh, that cartoon and that video just now. Um, maybe the plume doesn't go where you expect it to. <laughs> Um, you know, maybe you don't understand the subsurface that well, so it's possible that you're expecting the plume to go one way and it actually goes another way and there's a leakage pathway there, so you need to be careful about, um, about all of these things. Um, another important aspect of any CCS project is um, what's commonly called MMV, measure, Measurement, Monitoring and Verification. Um, so this is basically how can we keep track, um, measure and monitor where the CO2 is going um, when we uh, inject it. Um, almost all, in fact, I would say all CO2 um, sequestration projects have some uh, element of MMV. Um, so a number of different ways that it can be done. Um, seismic is a common one, particularly offshore, where, where you, there's a good contrast um, between uh, the uh, CO2 uh, um, injected and the um, initial condition. Um, the, the, the figures that I'm showing you on the right hand side here, these are from uh, 20 years of monitoring at the Sleipner project. This is one of the oldest, I think it might be the oldest purely CCS project in the world that's been going uh, since what 20 years before 2016, when was that? 1996. So what they did here was um, they took a baseline seismic survey before they started injecting. And then you can see the effect of injecting CO2. It just jumps out at you in the seismic. And what they did is they did a number of different surveys over you know, quite um, 
short time intervals, 1999, 2001, 2002, and so on. And you can see the plume growing. Yeah, this is absolutely textbook. Now, this is a bit of a science project, uh, I must admit, but this shows you the effectiveness of um, seismic monitoring. They know exactly where their CO2 is going because they can monitor it for seismic. Um, lots of other methods that can be used, um, gravimetric uh, methods. You can, uh, it changes the, uh, changes the gravity. Electromagnetic well base. If you've got wells, you can, uh, you can monitor through, through wells. Um, if you're offshore, you can do um, seafloor monitoring. Uh, you can do chemical seabed sampling. And very often these methods are used in combination. It's typically, you don't just use one. You might use a number of different methods um, depending on the um, uh, depending on the situation. Okay, I'm going to change gear a little bit now. So that's background. So I'm going to talk more specifically about the SRMS uh, now. I'm going to first. I'm going to ask you two questions. Um, I'm going to ask you: Are you familiar with the SRMS? Yes or no? And are you familiar with the PRMS? for desserts, um, yes or no. So let me just open up the chat and see what people are saying. So you can just sort of say uh, SRMS no, PRMS yes, something like that. Um, okay, what I'm seeing in the chat is SRMS no and PRMS yes. Okay, oh, I've got a yes and a yes from Peter. Um, I've got no and no. Yeah, so most answers are no to SRMS, but yes to PRMS. Well, I've got some good news for you. If you're familiar with the PRMS, SRMS will at least be partially familiar to you because it's, it's based on the PRMS. So, okay, let's sort of dive in more detail on the SRMS. Uh, so this is what it looks like. Um, it was released in uh, July 2017 by the SPE, another of those wonderful things that the SPE does for you. Um, and the three main things that it's concerned with are capacity, injectivity, and containment. Those things that I've just been talking about in the last few slides, that's why I've been talking about them. Um, it's available on the SPE website. You can download it for free. Um, you don't even need to be an SPE member, although um, uh, I, I hope you all are. I hope you've all paid your, paid your dues um, because you get a lot, a lot for it. Um, having said that, I'm going, to, I'm going to backtrack a little bit now and say um, th th there is another uh, document, just like the PRMS has got an application guidelines document to go with it. The, the SRMS also has um, an application guidelines document, which has only just been released. So I'll we'll just go back a couple of slides. The original SRMS was released in 2017. The guidelines were just released a few months ago. Um, but you have to buy these, <laughs> unfortunately. You do get a discount for being an SPE member. Um, you can also get a corporate subscription, which is based on the, um, the size of the company. So the, the guidelines for the, um, the SRMS, they provide additional guidance. They don't, it's not a new version, it's additional guidance. Yeah, so the SRMS from 2017 is still the SRMS, um, but it provides additional guidance. Um, a couple of other things. One of the most useful things, I think, is that it uh, includes some examples, and I'll, I'll, I'll briefly touch on some of those uh, today. Um, the other thing that's happened is that these other organisations have come in as co-sponsors. The original document was just from the SPE. Um, uh, now, um, co-sponsors have come in. Um, so why do we need the SRMS? What was the... What was the original intention, why was it developed in the first place? Well, um, the idea was um, there was a need for a universal framework, a, 
a common language, as I, as I like to say when I talk about the PRMS. The PRMS provides a common language for us to talk about reserves. And the intention of the SRMS is it's a common language for us to talk about um, carbon capture and storage. Um, and to answer these kind of questions, yeah, how much CO2 storage is available for this city, country, region, basin, whatever? Um, is there adequate storage for this particular project? Um, will this project be matured? And if so, what will the investment return be? Um, now, these kinds of questions are very familiar to the oil and gas industry. They're the kinds of things that we, that we deal with in the oil and gas industry all the time. Um, the PRMS already existed and was very well widely used um, and well understood. Um, so it seemed logical to, um, uh, to base the SRMS on the PRMS. Uh, so this is the stated purpose of the, uh, the SRMS. Um, this is quoting directly from the, from the document. So the intention is to assess the accessible pore volume within a geologic formation in which CO2 could be stored. Fairly straightforward, I think, i.e. storable quantities. It's intended for use in geologic formations completely saturated with brine, so that's the, the saline aquifers, and depleted hydrocarbon fields without hydrocarbon production. It's an important distinction here. The SRMS does not include consideration of CO2 for EOR. Right? So all those projects I've been talking about in, the, in North America, cannot be assessed using the SRMS. Now, I think the reason for that was to create a deliberate separation. Um, and I think this may largely be a sort of a political um, thing. So it's sort of more, more palatable to, um, to investors and other stakeholders. It's, it's CCS purely for the purpose of storing CO2. Because there is an argument, and I've, I've heard it many times, that um, uh, CCS for the purposes of enhanced oil recovery is just an excuse for you guys to carry on producing more oil and gas and um, you know destroying the environment even more. Um, so I think it's it's you know to, to to cut off that kind of argument and say no, we're only here dealing with capturing um, uh, CCS, capturing CO two in the subsurface. It's nothing to do with um, oil and gas production. Uh, that's my reading of, of that. Now, having said that, um, it does that the, the application guidelines actually do say that SRMS may be applicable um, to CO2 injection. So you can still come up with assessments of storable quantities, um, but that's not the purpose of the SRMS. Okay, so. If there's one slide about the SRMS, I've said about the PRMS. If there's only one slide you remember from today's presentation, um, I'd like it to be this one. Um, this is the SRMS in a in a nutshell. This is the SRMS uh, classification chart. Uh, what I've done here is I've actually taken two figures from the SRMS and kind of um, merged them together. But if you're familiar with the PRMS, th this will look very very familiar to you. Um, so what do we what let's let's just take you through it for those of you that perhaps aren't familiar with the, the PRMS and just to show you the differences. So first of all, we have two axes. Um, we have an, uh, on the horizontal axis, we have a range of uncertainty. And on the y-axis, we have a uh, what we call the project maturity um, axis. And we have three what we call classes of um, storage resources at the bottom. We have what we call prospective storage resources. Then we have further up, once we've made a discovery, we'll talk about what that means in a moment. We have contingent storage resources. And then the highest most uh, level um, is what we call capacity. Um, that's the equivalent 
to uh, reserves. Then on the, uh, the x-axis, we basically have uncertainty range, low best high. These are volumetric uncertainty ranges, yeah, quantity uncertainty ranges. And then uh, just on the far right, these are the subclasses, the um, subclassification of the project. And just as in the PRMS, the idea is an SRMS project should ideally mature up that y-axis and eventually um, become on injection and be actively injecting CO2 into the subsurface. Now, uh, as we said, if you're familiar with the PRMS, um, the basic principles are very much the same, but you will notice key terms have been changed. So reserves becomes capacity, resources becomes storage resources, and so on. So if we just move on and compare the two classification charts, um, I think I've just got these highlighted. So production becomes stored. So CO2 that's already in the subsurface is already, that's called stored. Yeah, and it's the equivalent of production. It's already been um, captured in the subsurface. Reserves becomes capacity. Contingent resources, contingent storage resources. Unrecoverable becomes what they call inaccessible. Um, perspective resources, perspective storage resources, and again, unrecoverable, inaccessible. Uh, the next um, similarity, let's just bring these guys all up. Three main components of a PRMS assessment are, you've got to have the subsurface, you've got to have the reservoir, you've got to have the, um, the entitlement, the, uh, the legal contractual right to produce hydrocarbons, and you've got to have the project, the spending of the money, the drilling of the wells and so forth. And SRMS is exactly the same. You've got to have the geologic formation, either the aquifer or the depleted oil and gas field. Um, for the uh, entitlement, you've got to have the right, the legal right to inject CO2 into the subsurface. And again, You've got to have the project, the wells that you're going to inject, the pipelines, sorry, the pipelines to bring the CO2 to, um, to the storage site. Um, SRMS is a project based system, just as uh, PRMS is. Um, the project. may be notional, I mean, particularly sort of at, at the stage where most, most sequestration projects at the moment are, are quite immature. So they might, a project might be notional, but you should still have a project, even if it's only sort of a, a, an idea. Well, how many wells am I going to drill? Where am I going to drill them? How much CO2 am I going to eject? At what rates? Um, you know, you, you need to think about these things because that's, that's what your project is. Um, The concept of subclasses is almost identical. In fact, I think it is identical. The only difference, is, let's go back. The only difference in the subclasses, I think, is, is here on production versus on injection. All these others are the same, same names, same concept as, uh, as PRMS. Uh, so in terms of definitions, let's start at the top with capacity. So these definitions are straight out of the, uh, the SRMS. So capacity are those quantities of total storage resources anticipated to be commercially accessible in the characterized geologic formation by application development projects from a given date forward under defined conditions. So same definition as PRMS, just with some of the words changed. Um, we'll talk about the, what commercial means a little bit later. 
Um, same thing for contingent storage resources. Uh, so same thing. Um, quantities of total storage resources estimated to be potentially accessible. And number of possible contingencies. There are very, very few projects currently that are in the capacity um, class. Uh, I'd say there's a lot of projects in contingent storage resources. Um, but again, same concepts. There are contingencies, and those contingencies may include uh, there's no source. Where's the CO2 coming from? Um, there's insufficient value. There may not be a carbon price, or the carbon price is too low to justify. Um, maybe immature from a technical point of view. You're still appraising. Um, you're not sure whether you've got whether you can contain the, um, the CO2. Um, and then prospective resources, again, same concept. Um, this would normally apply to uh, saline aquifers. Most saline aquifers, um, until you drill a well, are going to be prospective storage resources um, because you don't know um, what, the, uh, what, what, the, what the reservoir is, if you can inject. Now, uh, just as in PRMS, there are two major transitions. So there's the discovery status transition, there's the commerciality status transition, yeah, here and here. So let's talk about the discovery status transition first. A um, couple of key points. You must drill a well. So if you're in a situation where you think, oh, I've got a, uh, a saline aquifer that hasn't got any drill, any wells drilled, that will remain as a contingent, sorry, as a prospective uh, storage resource until you drill a well. Then when you drill a well, or you have some information, uh, let's say if you're in a depleted oil and gas field, you need to demonstrate, again, those three things we keep talking about. Um, you need to have accessible pore volume that has both quantity, as, as in, you know, enough pore space, and sufficient injectivity, that's typically going to be permeability, and suited to containment. Yeah, you need to have some way of containing the CO2, whether it be in a conventional trap, in a, in a, a residual um, trapping mechanism, as we, uh, as we talked about earlier. Now, more problematic, at least I think more problematic, is the transition from um, contingent storage resources to capacity. Um, you need a firm intention to proceed. So you have to have a commitment uh, to go forward, um, a reasonable timetable for development. This is the thing I think is usually most difficult. A, oops, sorry. A reasonable assessment of future economics. Um, very often, unless you're in a situation where you're somewhere like the US, where they have the, um, the 45Q uh, tax credit system, or Australia, where they have the, uh, what are they called? Um, ACUs, Australian Carbon Credit Units um, system, effectively a, a carbon price. Um, it may be difficult to meet this criteria. Your project may not make money. Uh, and I personally think it's, a, it's one of the problem areas of the SRMS is that it kind of assumes that your project is economic um, other, before you can reach capacity. Whereas um, I think that's a very high, high hurdle. It's a difficult thing to, to reach um, in many areas. Um, uh, you need to have um, an expectation of sustained demand for storage, i.e., you know, you need to have this, the CO2 needs to keep being supplied. You need to be able to inject, um, and you need to have all relevant legal, contractual, environmental, and so forth um, permits. 
Uh, I'm going to skip through these uh, because they're really just the same as PRMS, low, best, high. They're the, the range of uncertainty. Uh, same concept here as for uh, PRMS. Um, you can be injecting or not injecting. It can be developed and undeveloped. Same, same concept. Um, there is this, uh, what they call uh, inaccessible. So this is portions of storage resources that you can't get to. They're not available for, for, for storage. Now, one of the things that SRMS says is it's about regulatory circumstances. And the way that a lot of companies interpret this and the way that we in our company currently interpret this is without a regulatory system, um, inaccessible is where a project sits. So if you're in a country that doesn't have a regulatory system and a project doesn't have a permit uh, to inject CO2, then it should be treated as inaccessible. Now, I think you can still assess the range of uncertainty, but in terms of classification, I think it sits um, uh, as inaccessible. Uh, a couple more things. Now, the SRMS does not, it's not really a, a technical manual for how to do a technical assessment, but I, I will just I do have just a couple of slides on it. I'm not gonna talk about this in detail. Um, it does outline ways in which you can do a study. Um, so just as in PRMS, because um, CCS projects, there aren't very many of them, there aren't very many analogs, um, but if there are analogs, you, you, you can use them. Um, performance analysis you, you, you can use. So um, as you're injecting, uh, you can look at how pressures change. You can you, you can look at how your um, uh, you can do basically sort of transient stabilized flow. Some of the same things that uh, that you do as a um, as a reservoir engineer in assessing hydrocarbons. Um, just one thing I will say here: reservoir simulation is a very common and well used um, technique um, for CCS, um, particularly at the early stages when you're screening. Um, and uh, can be used actually all through the life cycle of a CCS project, but used in different ways. Um, so reservoir simulation is important. Um, volumetric analysis can also be done. So one of the key factors that you need to assess um, here is the efficiency factor. This is the equivalent of the recovery factor. Um, uh, SRMS does quote some numbers from the literature. So in an aquifer, they're typically quite low, just a few, a few percent. Um, in a closed system, they can be perhaps 30 or 40 percent. Um, in a depleted um, reservoir, they could perhaps be 40 or 50 percent. Um, but they'll all depend on circumstances, from reservoir quality, depth, um, and, and, and a number of other factors. Um, so economic and commercial, this is the same concept again as in PRMS. So economic refers to purely, does the project make money or not? And we talked about that may be a problematic issue for CCS projects, um, as opposed to commercial, where not only does it make money, but it meets all those other criteria as well. You have commitment, you have all your, all your um, regulatory permitting and so forth. So I'm just going to wrap up with a few examples. I realize we're probably coming up on time. So I'm just going to quickly go through some examples. Um, first example is Santos Mumba project. This is the only project I am aware of that has been publicly announced as capacity. That's the highest level of um, uh, classification status. Um, and Santos did this um, earlier this year, February 2022. Um, uh, I, 
I just have to mention that uh, Gaffney Klein were the auditors. We, we audited um, uh, Santos's work um, and we were very, very honored to be part of the first, what we believe is the first ever um, public reporting of a capacity um, project. Uh, so this is what the Santos project are doing. They're capturing CO2 from a, their gas processing plant and they're injecting it um, at, uh, in two depleted um, oil and gas fields. Um, uh, close, close by. Uh, example two, this is one you can read about more of in the SRMS guidelines. Uh, it's from the North Sea. It's the, uh, the Captain Sandstone. And what they've done here is they've looked at several different projects within um, this whole region. They've assessed them from a SRMS perspective. So here we've got the most mature ones, this uh, contingent storage resources um, on hold, and they've assessed a range of uncertainty, um, low best high estimates, and then the same thing for these other uh, um, other projects. Uh, this is this discussed in more detail in the SRMS guidelines. Um, example three. This is a, another slightly different example. Uh, this is from a the OGCI storage catalog. Um, this is a catalogue that basically goes out into the public domain and tries to capture all CO2 storage projects uh, that have been announced. And this is basically the summary that they, um, they come up with. Um, I guess the interesting thing to note from these numbers is how little uh, CO2 storage capacity there is currently. Um, just for comparison, global CO2 emissions in 2022 are estimated at 40 gigatons. We are currently have capacity that's actually planned, committed CO2 storage of 0.2. Remember we said we needed that massive ramp up? Um, well, these, these numbers uh, illustrate that very nicely. Uh, just one last example. It's not really an example of usage, but it's a, this, this just came out a few days ago. This is a very nice handbook released by the IEA. Uh, Indonesia is a associate country of the IEA, which you may perhaps already know. Um, but the IEA is very supportive of SRMS. Um, they support the use of uh, regional atlases and databases, and they support the use of the SRMS. So, right, just final concluding remarks. SRMS is being used internationally. We've looked at some examples just now. Um, the guidelines that we just talked about have just been released and they help to clarify. The SRMS is likely to become the international standard. I think there's a way to go before it gets there, but um, we're on that road. Uh, regulatory frameworks are still being developed in many countries, particularly here in Southeast Asia. Um, most countries are still developing their regulatory frameworks. That's a, to me, that's a key uh, barrier and also an enabler um, to CCS development, certainly in this part of the world. Um, there are some things you do need to think about carefully. Uh, one is this issue of commerciality that we talked about, the need for a project to make money. Um, second one is the need for a CO2 source. Where's the CO2 coming from? You need to think about that. Another is, this is related to the regulatory issues, is who owns the bore space and who has the entitlement? Um, another interesting thing is what, what we're seeing quite often is CCS is being developed as part of um, a hydrocarbon development project. So you've got a project that's got high CO2, you develop the um, the gas, for example, and you have to do something about the CO2. So very often it's being developed in an integrated manner. Um, unclear how that fits into the SRMS right now. And the other thing I find a little bit odd is I find it a little bit confusing using the same terminology as PRMS. I know we said it's based on PRMS, but I find the, uh, using the terms prove probable possible. Um, it, for SRMS, I've I, I think there's room for confusion there. Um, final slide is some of the references. And I'll leave it there for questions.
Yes, Cheryl, thank you so much for this tour explanation regarding the SRMS product. This is really insightful presentations. But I see some of the questions on the chat box. But before we enter to the Q&A session, I think we have to do the documentation first. So kindly for the participants to turn on your camera and use the virtual background that has been shared on the chat box. So we can wait for the next 30 seconds, I guess. So we can take a picture of us together before we entering the Q&A session. So please do. It has been shared by Mas Handika previously for the virtual background. Yes, thank you, Media, for opening the camera. And we are waiting for another participants to join the documentations. Let me see. Oh, we can just start now. Okay, sure. Okay. Okay. Uh, that someone is to, uh, entering the waiting room. Okay. Okay, guys, so uh, give us your best smile. I'm going to do a uh, screen save. Uh, now in the first screen, one, two, three, go. Okay, hold up. Let me save that first. Going to the next screen. One, two, three, go. Thank you very much. So that's all, Ms. Valen. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for opening your camera. You may turn it off again. And we are going to enter the q and sessions. Probably I will read the first questions here on the chat box. Um, so, Pak Doc, I couldn't remember how long it would take for the industry to standardize reserve reporting and adopt the PRMS or similar categorizations. In the case of SRMS, what are the important areas that, in your perspective, need to be measured in order for the industry to use this category globally? Uh, excellent question. Excellent question and one that, I, that, that concerns me. Yeah, I mean, some of you may have seen, I've done presentations on, on the history of reserves um, before that some of you may have seen. Um, it it take, takes many years, many decades um, uh, for the reserves um, uh, guidelines to, to evolve, and they have evolved with the industry over, over many years. Um, I, I think SRMS is going to have to follow a similar path. Um, if I, I'll just give you my personal view. I think the SRMS needs some, some tidy up. Um, I think it's a great start. Um, I think the, the basic building blocks are there. And the building blocks that I showed you, the classification um, chart. Um, I think there's some areas that it needs to tidy up. And I, I know the committee are working on it. I've got some colleagues. I have a colleague um, who, who's on the, on the committee working on that. Um, I think it will take time. I think the other thing that's happening is that as, as the, you know, now's the time the project, people are starting to think about projects and only in the last sort of last sort of two or three years really have we started um, looking at this kind of seriously. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's going to take time um, and I think it's going to have to evolve. I think in the industry generally there is not wide um, acceptance of SRMS. I think the, the fact that there was only one example that I quoted that, um, that had used um, SRMS for capacity sort of illustrates that. I think there'll be more. Um, uh, but yeah, I think it's going to take time. I think one of the other interesting things is I think a lot of SRM, a lot of CCS projects have gone ahead without needing the SRMS. You know, you don't, you don't need the SRMS in order to to go ahead with your CCS project. Um, so until people start um, uh, demanding it, so that would either be regulators or, uh, or, or investors, people, people financing um, projects, until people like that start um, asking for it, um, I don't 
it, it, it's going to be a slow process, but I think we're on that process. Um, and I, I think it's a, it's up to all of us to the idea of having common standards and common language. I, I think is, is extremely valuable, um, and I think it's up to all of us to um, uh, not only to use it, but I think also to if there's things we don't like about the SRMS, and there are things I don't like about it. I I, I highlighted a few of them a few minutes ago. Um, you know, let's let's improve it. Let's um, get it so that it is um, uh, fit for. Fit for purpose, but I, I think we're on that journey. I think we've made a good start, and I think we're moving forward. Okay, sure. So, can you recall how long it took for PRMs to be globally standardized for internationally? It's uh, around it, ten or twenty years now. Well, P PRMs. Uh, well, PRMs was released in the first PRMs was released in two thousand seven, but it was already using existing guidelines. Um, I, I don't think it's, it's a gradual process. It's not like you go from nothing to everything. I right. think it, 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 takes, it, it takes time. And an SRMS will take time. You know, it might take 10 years, you know, five years, 10 years. I, I, I don't know. Sure. Okay. Uh, thank you for the answers. Uh, maybe we can go to the next questions from Amas Eko Yudi Purwanto. Um, I assume that we need significant investment for CCUS such as well separation system, compressor, pipeline, all of them with corrosion resistant materials, such that the payout time will take some time. So how will CCUS stay relevant for a long period of time, particularly in the future when renewables take dominant role? Yeah, excellent. And that's an excellent question. Um, the, the, I'm not an expert in, in, uh, in, in costing and um, uh, facilities, but that there are a few things that I can um, I, I, I can say about this. Um, first of all, you, you know I showed you that value chain uh, figure quite quite early on about the, the you know the the capture the uh, the source the capture the transport and storage. Um, in most cases, the thing that the element the element in the value chain that costs the most is the capture. Capture is usually the biggest uh, single uh, factor. And it's particularly true if you're capturing from, uh, I've got a whole presentation on this, but um, from think, you know, the, those famous, those hard to abate industries that I talked about at the beginning, um, those are the most, the most expensive. Um, and just to illustrate that, one of the, uh, a lot of the CO2 projects that are already going ahead, the Santos Mumba project is a classic example. Um, it's where CO2 is already being produced um, from the gas processing. So you've already separated the CO2 out anyway. So the separation is already being done for you, if you like. CO2 is already in a highly concentrated form. So what you're injecting is, I think at Mumba, it's, it's something like 98% CO2. It's very, very pure CO2 stream. Um, thirdly, you're injecting it very close to the source. So the pipeline um, is, is very close. So your, your capture costs are low um, and you don't have, um, it's relatively, they can say relatively straightforward um, to, to, to sequester the subsurface. If you've got to capture the CO2 from a, a power plant, yeah, then you've got to, you've got to capture it. You've then, you've then got to compress it or liquefy it. You've got to transport it. That all, that all costs, uh, costs money. Um, and in a, in a full value chain, um, the money's, it's all up front. Um, so, uh, so yes, that, that, that is a challenge. Um, and that's why, um, you, like in Europe, the classic example, you need, those high, you need to have a high carbon price um, in order to justify the cost of those, of, of, of those projects. Um, one other thing I'll just say is how does CCS stay relevant in the future when renewables take a dominant role? Um, that comes back to what I said at the very, very beginning, that there are some industries 
that renewables can't replace. Renewables, you cannot use renewables for um, iron and steel. You cannot use renewables for uh, cement. Um, there are, and, and, and there are others um, that you cannot use renewables for, it just doesn't work. Um, uh, so there will always be a role for um, uh, the CCS for, for those. Okay, sure. Thank you for the answer, um, Paduk. Uh, hopefully this will answer the question from us, Echo. And we can go to the next questions from uh, Peter. How do you compare as RMS and the DNV methodology? Yes, uh, Peter, yeah, good, good, uh, good question. Um, so just for those of you who, who don't know, the, 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 the DNV methodology is it's very similar to the uh, the ISO uh, the ISO standards. Um, uh, the, the, the DNV is a it's a Norwegian company who basically they certify things. They certify things like um, LNG tankers and, and stuff like that. Um, and they they have a, a certification uh, methodology that they use for CCS projects. Um, like I say, it's very similar to the ISO system. Um, I'd say they're, they're different. How does it compare to the SRMS? They're different things for different purposes. So we talked about the SRMS, which is about the, the classification and the range of uncertainty. The, the DNV methodology and the ISO methodology, which is they're basically equivalents, um, they're more, uh, I'm not quite sure how to describe this without making it sound bad. They're, they're kind of like, they're, they're kind of um, project checklist type you know, do you have a project management plan? Tick. Do you have a subsurface assessment? Tick. Do you have a measure, measurement and monitoring plan? Tick. Um, it's more um, a sort of checkbox for kind of um, sort of project sanctioning, project sign off. Um, so it's not, and it's focused much more on things like. The, the management systems and the uh, the risk assessment and, and stuff like that. Whereas SRMS is more focused on um, sort of subsurface uncertainties and uh, containment and the risk of um, the risk of, uh, of, of of CO2 leakage and things like that. So I think I'd, I'd almost say they're complementary actually because they're. I'd say they're slightly different things for different purposes. I think that's the way I would um, I would look at it. You sure? Oh, thank you, Apadu, for the answers. Help this answer your question, but Peter. If you do have more questions, please just uh, put it on the chat box. Okay, maybe we can go to the next questions. Is from. Um, IRN. So saline wells have also been proposed to store hydrogen. Saline domes close to high demand sites might therefore become very in demand. Would this compete with CO2 storage as this would also increase demand for saline domes near industrial sites? Oh, it's an interesting question. Um, I haven't really thought about it, but let me have a, let me have a think about it now. Um, I, I guess potentially yes, because um, it, it's basically the, the it, it's basically the same. It's the, you're storing storing hydrogen. You're looking for this basically the same kind of things that you're looking for when you're storing CO two. You're looking for something that's secure. You're looking for something that's got a good a good cap rock, so you, it's going to be contained. You're looking for something that is not too far away from your from your source. Such that you don't have to pipe it or transport it a long way. Um, uh, I guess the, I think my short answer would be potentially yes. I think potentially there could be uh, competition for the um, for the very best sites. Um, but let, let me let me just say something else. And I think uh, is that there's a general. Uh, perception, I think you saw it in some of the statistics and those, those global statistics, is that there's a lot of storage capacity out there. Um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, volume there. 
I, I think that the question is, where are the best sites? Where are the most secure? Where are the most cost effective? Where are the, you know, the, depending on how you define best. Um, and best is usually a combination of those things, the right depth, the right location, um, the right geological condition, such that the uh, you can store large volumes with low risk. Um, so there's a lot of storage capacity, so it's like potential storage resources um, out there. Um, I think it's a question of finding the best ones. And yeah, the, I think there may well be um, competition for the, uh, for, the, for the best ones. Um, yeah, I think that is potentially true. Uh, okay. Sure. So um, in brief summary, could you please explain uh, the pro and cons between the CCS and the saline wells? The brief summary of the pros and contra that they may be um, uh, from the saline wells and the CCS. For, 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 for storing hydrogen, um, I, I, I'm, I'm not an expert in storing hydrogen, but I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, I'm assuming that it's entirely analogous. Um, I guess hydrogen is probably more, more mo I guess hydrogen is probably more mobile in the subsurface than CO2. So you probably need to be even more careful about things like containment would be, would be my guess. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, sorry, I don't know a lot about hydrogen storage, but my, my guess is um, it would be similar. Okay, sure. Okay, thank you for the answers. Hope this answer your question. And for the next question is from Pa Ernest. So in your experience, how many wells are usually drilled in pure European CCUS projects to be sure of geological conditions? And how does this compare to the number of wells that are usually drilled when developing an oil field for the same level of confidence? Oh, that's, an, that's another excellent question. It's a very interesting question. Um, yeah, I assume this is referring to uh, injecting into a saline aquifer, um, because obviously if you're injecting into a, a depleted oil and gas field, you've got all the wells that you've had from the, the oil and gas field. Um, I'm gonna, first of all, give you a, my st standard answer to these questions is it depends. Um, what does it depend on? Um, I would say as a generalization, uh, most saline aquifers that are planned for CO2 storage, not only in Europe, but any, anywhere in the world, um, are very often the same formations that we know from hydrocarbon production, but typically in either in synclines or in, in places where we haven't found um, oil and gas. So they're, so they're typically the same form. I mean, it's the same, you know, you're looking for good porosity and permeability, you're looking for good quality sands, the same things that we look for in, uh, in hydrocarbon reservoirs, but in places where um, we haven't found hydrocarbons. Um, so it may well be that you understand the formation quite well. You might, from a geological point of view, you might, um, you might know quite well what the geological characteristics are. It's not like you're drilling into a, um, a, a completely unknown um, area. That said, you would still need to drill some wells um, in order to, uh, to, to, to appraise. I, I'm, I'm not gonna come up with a, I'm not gonna tell you a number, you know, whether it should be um, two or three or four or five, but I, I, I would say generally it would be a smaller number um than you would uh do for, for for an oil and gas project um and that you know and the number would depend on how how well you understood the, the formation as a whole if you had lots of um nearby fields and you had hundreds of wells that you that you've you've used to characterize that formation um you probably have to drill fewer wells so yeah my, my general guess would be fewer. Um, okay, sure, it is uh, good news to hear. So we don't have to drill more wells for that. And probably this question just come up on the chat box is from Bajunaidi. So how is RMS incorporate uncertainties of containment in determining the resources? 
because containment is unlike storage and injectivity, which analogs with hydrocarbon in place and productivity? This, uh, this is a great question. Um, this question, I, I, I agree with you. Um, I think this is one of the problem areas in SRMS that I think needs more attention. <laughs> um, uh, the way SRMS is written, containment is a, it's almost like an on-off thing. You either have containment or you don't have containment. Whereas in fact, uh, containment is an uncertainty in my view. Um, and in particular, it's an uncertainty that the, the more you inject, um, the greater the risk of leakage um, in, a, in, in, in a general sense. I think we all, we all know that all, all, cap, all seals have a, have a spill point. Yeah, so, so hydrocarbon traps are filled to capacity. They're not filled to a structural spill. They will all leak. If you keep putting hydrocarbons into a hydrocarbon trap, it will, it will leak eventually. If you keep putting CO2 into, a, um, into the subsurface, it will leak eventually. The more you put in, the more likely it is to leak. Um, the more you put in, the higher the pressure, the more likely you're going to breach the cap, the more likely you're going to reactivate uh, faults. Um, uh, so yes, so my, my short answer is yes, I think it's an uncertainty. Um, the way I would assess that and the way that, that, that we would treat that in, a, um, in an SRMS, if you came, came to me and said, you know, I want to do an SRMS assessment for this project, I would say, well, if, if that's an uncertainty, at what point would you have to stop, in, at what point would you have to stop injecting? One of the, I didn't mention this, but let me just mention it now. When we talked about the measurement, monitoring, verification, Another important factor there is you're not only monitoring what, where the CO2 is going, you need a plan to say, how are you going to stop the CO2 escaping? So if, if you inject and you discover that it's leaking, right, what can you do? Well, you can shut the project down. You can inject at a lower rate. You can inject in a different place, into a different formation, perhaps, you know, there are mitigations there are mitigation actions that you can do and that, uh, that, that's what a good ccs project should do but i think in terms of this containment issue the way i see it is is there a risk that it may be this, this, there's a certain amount you can inject and there's a, a low risk of of um sort of high confidence in containment but as you start injecting more that risk increases and the way I would do that is I would incorporate that in the in the range of uncertainty. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's a difficult it's a difficult area in SRMS. Um, I certainly agree. Okay. Okay, thank you for the answers, uh, Badu. Hopefully, uh, this would answer your questions, Badu Nadi. And probably we will go to the last question from the chat box is from okay. Pat Peter. So, Doug, uh, it often told that saline aquifers seem implying salty water conditions, whereas in this part of the world, we have fresh water aquifers. I suggest that this may be an advantage. Uh, Peter, yes, it is an advantage. Um, I would agree. Funnily enough, I was in, um, I, I, I was, <laughs> let me tell you the opposite side of the story. I was in the, I was in the Middle East. Um, a few weeks ago, doing a, I was doing a training course, and um, we were talking about just this issue, and they they were expressing the opposite concern. They were saying, um, here in the Middle East, all our all our aquifers are very salty. Um, uh, so so yes, it is it is certainly true, and I'm sure the reservoir engineers, as many of you are, know this is that um, um, that the CO2 will dissolve more favorably. In a in a in a fresher, uh, you know, less salty aquifer than it will in a in a salty aquifer. Um, so yes, it is it, it's an advantage. Um, uh, you, you should you should be able to dissolve more CO two in a in a fresher aquifer. Yeah. Sure. Okay. So probably before we close these Q and A sessions, I have a question myself. 
So um, as I am a business analyst um, and I know energy, I would ask you, um, are you involved or were you involved in CCS projects in Indonesia before or currently? <laughs> you can cannot I, say that, right? Can okay. I, I can I can say yes, but I can't tell you. Oh, okay. That's that's, that's fine. Tell you because it's confidential. Yeah. Um, okay. Cool. That's fine. Though my question is. Um, answer yes. Yeah. Uh, the question is: Can you please a uh, little bit explain the challenges you face in this projects in Indonesia? Oh. Um... I think the I think the challenges actually I, it's not I don't think the challenges are specific to Indonesia because I've worked on uh, actually I'm working working on quite a few oh. projects in let's just say in Southeast Asia um, and I think I, I think the challenges are they're quite often common so let me just I could just outline so this is a these are high level comments first one is um, regulatory um, issues. I think, I think that's common to Indonesia, Malaysia, Brunei. I think it's common, common to the region. Um, I think the industry is crying out for, um, for regulation. Uh, companies want to have certainty. They want to know what their situation is before they invest large sums of money in, in these kind of projects. So they want um, to understand the regulatory situation and also the, you know, the carbon you know, carbon markets, carbon pricing, how, how that kind of thing is going to work on the sort of regulatory side of things. On the, on the technical um, side of things, um, I think, I mean, there's obviously a huge amount of potential here because there's a lot of large, large depleted sure. oil and gas fields. So I think from a sort of storage, um, and, I've, I've done, and we've, we've looked at several, uh, projects that have large storage um, uh, potential, you know, particularly depleted oil and oil gas fields. So you have confidence in containment. Um, potential risks are the same ones we talked about before, old, old well bores. Um, uh, I think one of the other um, uh, the CO2 sources is, uh, is also, again, what, a lot of the same things we've talked about. Where's the CO2 going to come from? I've, I've worked on projects whereby um, CO2, it's gonna come potentially from, from, from industry. I've worked on other projects where the CO2 is coming from um, other gas fields that have a high CO2 content and they need somewhere to, to, to park, the, park the CO2. So I think the things, a lot of the things that we talked about in the presentation, um, very much applied to um, Southeast Asia in general, not just not just Indonesia. Okay, thank you for the answers, Pradok. So probably that will be the last question. So thank you so much for your time explaining those details things regarding the CCUS, and hopefully this will be benefit for all of the participants that has been attending their sessions. So probably um, again, thank you, Pardo. Please give him a applause, and I will hand it over to you, Mas Valen, as the SP Jaffa Committee. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, thank you, Mbak uh, Diovani. Thank you, Pak Doc. Uh, so uh, we 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 are at the end of the webinar. It's a very good one. Uh, thank you so much for for everybody who's still uh, in the room. So first, we will give a token of appreciation for our uh, speaker and moderators. Uh, it will be done by Mbak Dian. Mbak Dian, over to you. I will uh, show the certificate first. It is for Pak Do. Okay, thank you, Mas Valen. And thank you, Pak Do and Mbak Diovani yeah, for a great session today. <laughs> Um, so as a token of appreciation from SPE Java Indonesia section, we would like to present Pak Dog with this e certificate. Unfortunately, we cannot present this to you directly, yeah. but we hope this shows our appreciation for your time and effort to share your valuable knowledge with all of us. Uh, so for everyone, let's unmute and give a big round of applause for Pak Dog. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Terima kasih banyak. And uh, likewise, we would like to present this uh, certificate to our moderator for today, Mbak Diofani. Thank you for your contribution to our program and appreciate your help to run the session more smoothly. So once again, let's give a big round of applause for Mbak Diofani as well. Okay. Terima kasih. Thank you. Thank you, Mbak Dian. And uh, before we go, let's um, do a documentation, yeah, for the session, please. Yeah, Mbak. I already put a print screen and oh, already? my memory. Yeah. In the laptop memory. Okay. <laughs> already <Thank> done. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Mbak Giovanni and Pak Dog. Okay. Thank, thank you, Mbak Dian. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Thank you. So, yes. this, is, this is the end of our technical discussion group uh, session uh, on behalf of SPE Java Indonesia. Uh, I would like to thank uh, you all of you who are still attending this. Uh, for the participant, please uh, provide your feedback. Uh, it's in the QR code over there. You can just scan it using your uh, phone camera. Uh, you also will receive uh, some e-certificate if you uh, put some feedback uh, uh, to us. And also don't forget that we are going to continue with uh, several webinars in this CCUS series. Uh, maybe some will be offline tentatively. Uh, so. Stay tuned and keep up a uh, date with our event activity. Follow us in the all the social media. And I can call it a wrap. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you on behalf of uh, all of the community and XP Java uh, section. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you.